Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Corker, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to speak on the next steps to achieve a comprehensive deal in the negotiations with Iran. Please permit me to focus my remarks on the perceptions of America's Middle Eastern allies, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf Sheikhdoms, Turkey, Egypt, and Jordan. When one speaks to elites across the Middle East, one encounters a prevailing climate of skepticism regarding the negotiations. The tale that our allies tell about the thaw in relations between the United States and Iran is markedly different from the tale that the Obama administration itself is telling. The administration begins its story by pointing to a change of heart in Tehran, to the supposed decision by the government of Hassan Rouhani to guide Iran toward reconciliation with the international community. Our allies, by contrast, start their story by pointing to a strategic shift in Washington. They perceive the Obama administration to have abandoned the traditional American role of containing Iran. They now see the United States instead in a kind of silent partnership with the Islamic Republic. In my prepared statement, I investigate the history of that perception. In the interest of time here, suffice it to say that the idea of a silent partnership was taking shape in the minds of our allies even before the administration signed the Joint Plan of Action, the JPOA, on the Iranian nuclear question. And the JPOA, in turn, confirmed the sense of that silent partnership. While many in Washington interpreted the JPOA as a sign that the Rouhani government was making a good faith effort to bring Iran into compliance with the non-proliferation treaty, America's Middle Eastern allies were more inclined to interpret it as a sign that the Obama administration was retreating from long-held positions without receiving reciprocal concessions from the Iranians. Over the last year, five major trends in American policy have deepened the perception of American retreat from leadership and a silent partnership between Washington and Tehran. First, our allies perceive increased coordination at the diplomatic level and in military operations between the United States and Iran and Syria. Just two days ago, the regional press noted that the Iranian Air Force was carrying out sorties in Iraq against the Islamic State. The Iranians, the press noted, could not have conducted operations in such close proximity to the Americans without significant levels of coordination between the two. Second, this increased cooperation has not produced any change in the malign Iranian policies that historically have deeply threatened America's allies. To name just a few of those policies, Tehran continues to support Palestinian terrorist organizations to build up Shiite militias in Iraq, to empower the worst element of Bashar al-Assad's murder machine, and to supply Hezbollah with mi missiles capable of striking all major population centers in Israel. Third, our allies have noted the continued American refusal to build up the Syrian opposition in ways that might threaten the Assad regime. They read that refusal as proof that the president regards Syria as an Iranian sphere of interest. Fourth, <clears throat> the rhetoric of the administration is frequently hostile to traditional friends. When Vice President Biden, at a recent talk at Harvard, stated that our allies are the problem, and when a senior official in the White House denigrated the Israeli Prime Minister in the crudest of terms, they were merely airing publicly viewpoints that administration officials have shared privately for at least a year. Fifth, and not least, the conduct of the United States in the nuclear negotiations has confirmed our allies' perception that American resolve is flagging. When, when uh, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei made clear his refusal to dismantle a single centrifuge, the administration retreated from established positions. As a result, our allies are now asking if it isn't the Americans and not the Iranians who are in need of a face-saving agreement. The alarm of our allies is worrying for a whole host of reasons, but two are particularly worth noting. First, their alienation from the President's regional strategy is undermining his ability to build an effective coalition against the Islamic State. It is a hard fact of life that we cannot win the conflict without developing Sunni allies. On the ground, we need Sunni troops. We need trusted, trusted Sunni troops, troops that are trusted by the local population who are capable of holding the cities and towns from which we will drive ISIS. In the region more broadly, we need a committed coalition of Sunni states. However, as long as we are aligned with Iran and with its allies, who have a well-deserved reputation for sectarian murder, we will fail to attract Sunnis to our banner. The second reason for caring about our allies' morale re relates directly to the nuclear negotiations. 
The, de the demoralization of our friends emboldens Ali Khamenei. The five trends in American policy that deeply unsettle our allies have the effect of reassuring the Iranian leader. They indicate, among other things, that his intransigence is unlikely to provoke President Obama into ratcheting up economic sanctions, let alone contemplating military action. With the threat of economic pressure diminished and the military option all but non-existent, American regional strategy incentivizes Iran to hold out for more concessions. If the administration does not take steps immediately to reconstitute the leverage that it held over Iran just a year ago, then we can be assured that the next round of negotiations will result in the further erosion of the American position. The first step toward regaining that leverage is for the President to sign a new sanctions bill that will demonstrate to the Iranians and to our allies in the region that our patience is not endless. The second step is to dispel our allies' perception of the silent partnership. Such action begins, but is by no means limited to building up an effective opposition to the Assad regime in Syria. I thank you again for asking me to testify. It's a great honor to speak before this body on such an important issue.